I'm glad to welcome you at this roundtable organized as part of the Russian French Industrial Forum. I am Adrien Lanier, the president of Nokia Inno, the center of technological cooperation of the French Russian Chamber of Commerce and Industry, uh, the organizer and today moderator of this event. And I invite now our dear speakers to take part of the panel discussion. Mr. Vladimir Dyrdov, the head of uh, digital technologies of the Russian Ministry of Economy. Mr. Jean-François Legrand, the ambassador of the French Alliance Industrial de Culture. Yannick Lepret, director for innovation and technology of Field Groups. Benoit Jobert, the manager of Adub Technology in Russia. Henri Pais, expert of big data analytics of EIC Group. Mr. Peter Durkan, who is uh, the manager of 3D Ceram, the French uh, leader in additive ceramic technologies. Jean-Pierre Koch, technical director of Exis Group. And Mr. Patrick Fardeau, vice president of Nasso System. that as a preamble, I would like to highlight that Russia and France have a long-standing cooperation in the scientific world, and since 92, our industry collaborates successfully with nuclear trust and strategic sectors. Since the beginning of the sanctions, it's important to note that no French companies left this country, and even more, France is today the first foreign employer in Russia. It is an important fact which was also highlighted by the President Vladimir Putin during the meeting we organized in February with the French CEOs. On the topic that we have today, the industry of the culture, it is a new production revolution and the comp that competitiveness factor will not be won by cost alone. And the goal of France is to be an innovation leader to push the technological frontier and to create the future application technologies. During the visit of the French President Macron at Saint Petersburg Economic Forum. The topic industry of the future has been discussed to strengthen the ties of both countries. A roundtable gathering the Russian and French leaders from political and industrial sphere has been organized and the result is that there is a common mutual openness and willingness to cooperate in this strategic direction. Today during this Russian French industrial roundtable at Inofrom, the French technological leaders will share their vision and experience in these technologies with the Russian Ministry of Industry and Trade, which will describe the domestic strategy and policy. Mr. Drozdyov, you are the head of the Department of Digital Technologies of the Russian Ministry of Industry and Trade. Can you introduce your vision on the digital transformation? What are the programs led by your ministry and what cooperation frameworks the French companies can expect? Thank you very much. I'm then happy to greet you here at Innoprom in Yekaterinburg. All our colleagues became friends and relatives basically for us because it's the fourth or fifth meeting we have and it's very pleasant that we have cooperation not only in words, but we have practical deeds, both on this forum and on other venues. We've been discussing quite a lot on different levels how important it is to digitalize different spheres of our economy. And not to indulge in empty words in mere verbiage, I would like to point out the key aspects of our work. Our ministry is involved in working out strategic documents which describe our approaches to digitalizing of manufacturing. There are functional blocks of this program. This May, the president of the Russian Federation signed a decree about national goals and strategic priorities of the Russian Federation. 
and one of the key aspects in this decree is the issue of speedily implementing digital technologies and first and foremost transformation of economy for mining industries, extracting industries to use newer platforms and newer software and newest digital technologies. To develop and to pursue this decree, we are preparing a national program, Digital Economy. And this Digital Economy project includes a separate section on digital manufacturing. This is quite an ambitious task for us. We have been using our administrative experience but as administrators, as public officials, we cannot answer the question why this or that enterprise should choose this or that model, change this operation in a different way. And of course, while preparing this program, we try to summarize the best practices and the best experiences which we have both in our country and abroad. And in this respect, the experience of our French colleagues is precious for us. And it plays a very important role. It's of huge assistance to us, not only because we have the opportunity to avoid mistakes we could have made, but also we can choose the best practices which have already been tested by our French partners both in France and in Russia. Thus, our business is actively involved into formulation of this strategic program, both from the viewpoint of new approaches and from the viewpoint of practical solutions which are going to be tested as pilot projects and uh, this fall, this winter, we are going to implement these projects already. At the first stage, we are planning to go into more detail, to be more in a more comprehensive way to assess the level of digital transformation of different uh, enterprises and work out the criteria of efficiency of digital transformation. We've been doing that in military industrial complex and now we are trying to do the same in the civilian production. We would like to find answers to the questions, what a digital enterprise is, what are the most important elements, what technologies the enterprise needs, and while implementing these technologies, what goals should we pursue and how the state can be helpful at that, how the rating of digital transformation can influence the initiatives of joint cooperation between a private enterprise and the government, and how the governments can participate in the projects that would support such enterprises. Eventually, we are planning within two years to involve large-scale enterprises and the most part of medium-sized enterprises, and then we will receive a dynamic picture, but quite realistic picture of how much digital solutions are implemented in our life. We will be able to assess the whole picture, and we set it as our goal to stimulate our own production, first and foremost, between different industries which would be capable of connecting different services for the industry, both the services which already exist and which are worked out. And this will give access to our enterprises, which is not accessible right now. And we understand that in the global world, in the global economy, service is the most important thing. We are talking not so much about the market of goods as a market of services, and supporting the market of services is the priority task for us. The second direction of our work is teaching new personnel, 
creating centers of competences, centers of engineering solutions, so that large enterprises can have an opportunity and have a room for maneuver to work out their educational program and brush up programs for re-educating their personnel together with the leading institutions. The third direction of our work is connected with the hardware market for digital economy. And here the ministry plays the key role. The solutions which are going to be worked out by Russian enterprises are not aimed only at mining industry. They can be used in healthcare, in public transportation, in agriculture, in logistics, in other spheres of economy which need digital transformation. To be more exact, we have already quite an experience of cooperating with our colleagues in the sphere of additive technologies and we plan a project with a DAP company with an institute of aviation technologies. The project will be presented in Samara. That's only the first pilot project and that's the first result of the work we started last year. And I wish you beneficial discussion and success in your work here on this forum. Thank you. Russian vision and Russian policy, and uh, we are glad to see that uh, the French companies are already uh, working on this direction in cooperation with the Russian companies. Jean-François Legrain, you have been appointed as the ambassador of the French Alliance Industrial du Futur. Can you describe what is the alliance, what are the objectives, and the missions? Thank you. Bonjour, Pavlovsky. <coughs> I will speak in Russian. I'm pleased to be here, I'm Jean-Francois Legrand, and I represent the French Alliance Industry of the Future, and it was created with the help of the French government in 2015. The Alliance coordinates and organizes all initiatives and projects aimed at modernization of French industry and transformation in concordance with new realia. Our actions are aimed at developing new initiatives for the future, for supporting initiatives that help enterprises modernize their production, their logistics, their supply, how they can use practical solutions, digital solutions in their practice. We've prepared a short presentation. And the aim of this presentation is to explain how we, the French, understand the industry of the future and which program of cooperation we have here in Russia. Please, uh, on the technical, can we have the slide, please? Thank you. The slide of Jean-François Legrand of the Alliance Industrial Future. The first slide is going to appear right now. It's a scheme, uh, an outline. Here it is. Let's go further. That's the first slide, and that's how we understand new industrial organization, thinking from the viewpoint of the future of the plant. It includes close cooperation with internet. Everything is interconnected, and I would like to emphasize it, that according to the data of the World Information Center of Industrial Investment, after analyzing more than 7,000 projects, more than 40% of projects had one or several parameters which are typical for the plants of the future. So we cannot ignore this process. It's already going on. 
the digital technologies what's the point of digitalization that's increasing productivity in industry by creating flexible production as opposed to traditional understanding of manufacturing the plant becomes smarter and uh, it becomes more interconnected with the logistical chain with the suppliers chain both outside the plant and within the plant and now this slide is how the alliance understands the algorithm of the industry of the future those are the subject matters that we are discussing within the framework of the industry of the future that is digitalization of course everybody speaks of digitalization that is robotics that is automation which are also very important and we are going to discuss that and the role of a human being is very important when we talk about the future that's also control and monitoring and of course that's energy efficiency this is new materials composite and new materials and of course this is new technologies of production to be brief the plants of the future will be more flexible will be smarter and will be cleaner within the framework of the alliance industry of the future in france we have the largest french companies that are the most active in the industry of the future that is the so system we see michelin and uh, all these companies are supported by the government of france and we act very actively and decisively in developing the industry of the future and now i would like to tell you more about our tasks and about our roadmap which we have for the territory of the russian federation our task is clear to develop cooperation with our russian colleagues and partners within the field of industry of the future that's the logical consequences of the unique cooperation which we have between ussr russia and france which is a unique way and uh, was created uniquely originally by general de gaulle and this cooperation continues both in the science and in other spheres it used to be on the intergovernmental level and now it exists between private partners and our task is to activate make these links between russian and french partners more active and more viable during the saint petersburg forum the president of medef international and alexander shohin signed a very important document that's an agreement about cooperation between medef and russia in the field of industry of the future that is going to be our roadmap and the subject matters which we are going to be involved in that is new technologies additive technologies composites robotics digital technologies in manufacturing modeling and digital doubles artificial intellect the internet of things and uh, prophylactics preventive care our next step during the forum in saint petersburg together with nauka innov we conducted a very important round table which was called industry of the future and it involved uh, representatives of the leading russian and french companies and uh, the ministry of the trade and industry of the russian federation we decided that the next step in the development of our french russian cooperation about industry of the future is to organize french russian meetings in october 2018 in moscow we are proud of this cooperation and we would like to make it even more vital vibrant 
and it is not mere words, as you said. We would like, as you said already, to discuss in Moscow in October specific ideas and implement them in the future, and we will participate very actively in that. Thank you very much for your attention. of uh, how France is structuring, coordinating this uh, industry of the future program. You present a roadmap with technologies, but we know also that uh, this industry of the future program will change fundamentally the education, and we need to prepare the future engineers with which will use this technology. How does the Alliance Industry of the Future is taking, taking up this uh, challenge? Yes, that's right. Teaching new engineers is a key priority, and I would like to say that Russia and France have uh, several issues to discuss together and share their experience. And we have a very important social responsibility. We should be ready to train in retraining, re-educating personnel, and the issue of education is included into the agenda of our October meetings, and this is a very important point. Inside education, uh, the industrial digitalization and the democratization of technologies is providing a huge potential in, uh, for new opportunities in the real sector of the economy, but it's also a threat as uh, actually most half of the, of the companies of the Fortune 500 disappear since uh, 2000 uh, years. Yannick, you are the director of innovation and digital of FIV Group, a world leader in industrial equipment. How do you see this industrialization revolution and how do you include the digitalization in your process and solutions? Thank you, Adrien. So, first, we mentioned, and you mentioned, Jean Francois, many uh, technologies that are related with, with what we call industry of the future. And uh, I really think, in fact, that one of the most relevant technology is the fact that everything is connected and that combined with very high capacity for computing data. And both these elements together change the structure of uh, the uh, machines that we build and the way we interact. In fact, uh, we switch from a pyramidal uh, structure of data processing to a networked, distributed network organization. For instance, it's now very much easy to exchange information along the supply chain because of the connectivity that is allowed using new software like PLM, for instance. Uh, and this improves a lot the efficiency of the supply chain. At plant level, we switch from a traditional pyramidal architecture with level one, level two, level three, level four architecture in terms of uh, uh, automation. Uh, and we switch to, uh, let's say, enterprise network uh, that allows to share information at different levels on the same infrastructure. And this allows a much quicker analysis of the data that are generated from all elements in this chain and the capacity to generate by data processing new information based on this, uh, this data. This changes the way you can make decisions and the way you can organize the production. This also sometimes leads to a radical change in the organization of the machines. Uh, as an example, I will select one you probably have heard already uh, and that you, you know, is uh, if you consider Amazon and the way they organize their warehouses. It was a traditional vertical, a huge building with uh, many arrays of, uh, with, with shuttles taking goods from one place to another and they have moved to a network-based organized architecture uh, based on robots, individual robots, moving through a, a, a hall and able to transport the goods from one place to a human being able to sort it. So this is possible because you have a first robot that is able to process its own data that are necessary to fulfill its uh, task, but also because you have the capacity to deal with a large amount of information coming from many, let's say, thousands of such robots and coordinate their movements in a whole to produce one single uh, task, which is the management of goods in a whole. This also applies to many other industrial applications. 
And uh, this is basically our job at FIV, uh, to be able to think new architectures for industrial production lines and to be able to deal with the data that we can generate out of these infrastructures. In fact, uh, using all these new technologies remains one question, which is the basic one we have to answer is, which technologies do we have to select and how do we have to implement them in order to be more efficient? And this question of efficiency, of the purpose, in fact, of the use of technology is very important. Our answer at FIVS level is to say we want to supply the best equipment possible, but we do not want to let our customers alone with their equipment once it's been commissioned. So we are deepening the notion of service because first we think we can bring value because we manage the processes that are linked with our equipment, the processes for which our equipment were designed, but also because communicative technologies, uh, the fact of connecting machines, makes it possible for us to help our customer better operate our equipment. So it's really because this technology was made available that we are able to help our customers through the whole life cycle of the products we are supplying. And we can do that by, for instance, gathering data and help improve the processes by better monitoring uh, the conditions under, under which the processes are uh, operated. And we can act in real time in order to change the parameters in order to realize the target production. We can also help by better uh, maintenance of our equipments, either because we have a remote access to the equipments and we can have also remote access to our own technicians, even if they are not located in the plant of our customer. But also because through the analysis of data, we can generate recommendations on how to uh, modify uh, the, the behavior of the equipment in case uh, there is a drift in its uh, normal operations. So this is very much linked with the technology, but the main important thing is to be able to understand what will really help our customers. And this has to be very specific and the result of many discussions and interactions between the end users and the designers of the equipment. Thank you. We understand that you have a very much uh, customer-oriented approach. Uh, your group has a very long uh, history in <coughs> Russia uh, with more than 100 years of presence here in this country. Can you share one uh, customer experience here, that you, how you support them? Yes, uh, if I have to select one in Russia, I think uh, w a very good example of what we can do is in the steel industry. We, we have a, a strong activity in that uh, industrial area. One of our customers, in fact, it's Severstal uh, in uh, St. Petersburg, uh, has requested us to uh, equip uh, their old production uh, with a monitoring system starting from the blast furnace up to the galvanizing line downstream of their process uh, in order to uh, help them to improve the quality of their steel dedicated to automotive applications for which the level of value is much higher than for uh, common industrial applications. And because we are able to combine a very strong uh, understanding of the metallurgical process together with softwares and data analysis, we are able to uh, tell the customer very early that a problem occurs on one of his equipments and how we can modify the equipment style streams in order to repair that if he wants to keep the quality and if it is possible, or on the contrary, to discard this product and reattribute it to uh, less demanding customers. So this allows huge savings for our customers because of this dynamic reaffectation of the product according to the level of quality can, that can be assessed. Thank you, thank you very much. Patrick, you are the vice president of Dassault System. As it has been mentioned already, this uh, digital revolution is moving uh, the industry value from product to services and to mass production to mass customization. How does your group support this revolution and your customers? Thank you, Adrien. Good afternoon to everybody. Uh, first of all, I'm very honored and pleased to be here. And uh, I was delighted also about the opening speech of the representative of the government because I believe that the strategy he just drawn is uh, absolutely pertinent and all the ingredients are there 
in terms of uh, future success. So I believe now it's more a question of execution than a question of knowing what to do. Um, as the introduction uh, of uh, the Dassault system, you have understood that uh, we are also part of uh, Alliance of uh, the Future. Um, is it because we are a French company? Uh, no. It's because we are a global company. So we have an experience of pro providing our solutions uh, all over the world, uh, in many countries, almost all countries, and to many industries, 12 industries. So we are well known for automotive, uh, we are well known for aerospace, but you might be surprised also to know that uh, we provide also solutions for healthcare to modelize the body. One of the largest acquisitions we did three years ago was in the domain of modelizing the DNA of the body. And the reason is that we want to be able to provide to everybody a capability to modelize and virtualize all universe. Why? Look at a car today. A car without any connection to satellite, any connection with the road, any connection with electricity system is no more operated. So the world is not only connected between companies and supply chain, the world is totally interconnected between the different industries, the people and the universe. That's why we provide a platform which supports this kind of innovation. And um, when we talk about uh, industry of the future, first of all, we believe that we are already in this future. Because while we are talking now, some companies have already implemented it. And the key question is uh, the model. Because um, all countries, all companies want always to know what's the best model, uh, how to copy, how to get faster. And uh, there are things that must be done, things that not must be done. But from our observation, um, it's not coming from um, military organization. It's not coming from large companies. The best models are coming from startup. Because today when you look at startups, whatever they are in space, they are in um, health, uh, industry or they are in automotive industry, those companies are created by people who are born in the digital world. They are breathing the digital world. And uh, that's not an accident if, for example, all automotive startups in California have adopted our platform. And the main reason is that they want to go fast. They want to be quick. They want to be very quick on the market. They want to be on quality. And they want to be able to produce very quickly in volume. And for that, they cannot continue to use traditional tools. So the question, in fact, is not so much integrated uh, the manufacturing production. The question is integrating all the enterprise with the overall ecosystem. Again, I will take the example of automotive. Today, the limit of an electric car is the battery. But there are somewhere in the world people who have invented a new battery. So if you are not able to integrate very quickly this new battery, this won't work. And that's not an accident if you observe some large company like, I will take aerospace, which is my, my favorite industry, like Boeing or Airbus, if they have created incubators of startup. You might probably heard about this uh, flying taxi developed either by Airbus or by Boeing, but you have not heard about something which is very innovative, which is a kite that is used also to reduce CO2 emission, uh, fuel consumption for ships. Can you believe it was also invented in Airbus? So today a company doing plane is not only thinking about making plane better, producing more plane, and they have to do it, no doubt about that. But also they have to think about the future and get inspiration from startup. And this is what we call, we don't call it industry of the future in Dassault. We, we go back to five centuries ago and we call it renaissance of industry. You know, this is the time where Gutenberg invented the printing system, where the knowledge and the know become accessible to everybody. And today, with the digitalization of the industry, we believe that the automation, the, the way it is spread and people are interconnected, makes the digital capability available and affordable for everybody. Thank you very much. You, you mentioned uh, many customers all around the world, but what about an experience here with uh, Russian customers? Can uh, you share one have, example? <laughs> we have a lot, so it's always difficult to mention one because immediately the other one are uh, always unhappy. So I will take the risk. 
uh, I will mention Rosatom. Why? Because uh, when we talk about uh, digitalization, uh, and we will be maybe surprised, for me it's not a question of technology. There are a lot of uh, digitalization technologies that exist since maybe 30 years. Uh, the question is how much people accept to transform their organization to make the digital technology efficient. Because at the end of the day is what? Is to do better service, as you say, Gilles, uh, is to sell more, is to make customers more happy, and is to beat the competition. That's the economic work. We are not in a child game. And uh, for that, a company needs further and foremost a leader. A leader at the top who accepts to transform and takes the risk to transform, which means change the people, change the organization, change the process. And as such, you might say you didn't give an example, so I will give an example now. Uh, we found a leader in Russia, which was Mr. Limarenko, who was boss of uh, Rosatom, and he was really a leader who wants really to transform his company. And uh, through his leadership, uh, we had a very efficient and powerful uh, deployment of our solution. And uh, you will be probably astonished to know that we have a company in France doing also nuclear power plants which has not adopted the system solution. So sometimes you are French, but French doesn't like you. So Rosatom was the first adopter of our solution before France, and he was beating our French company on the market selling your nuclear power plant. And then after, our company understood and adopted also our solution. Thank you for this uh, interesting case. You mentioned that uh, uh, despite the modification of business model, we are also changing the organization. We see that today in some sectors uh, we are perhaps reaching the end of the Taylor model where organizations are following the production flow. And uh, for instance in France, uh, Airbus is investigating now some new organization model with more independent structure working on case to case and following some technology. How the founder of the Alliance Industrial of the Future, FIV and the system, are you integrating also this new change in the solution? Maybe. Yannick first, and, and then uh, Patrick. In fact, uh, we think that basically you can change the flexibility of a plant by using uh, software systems that enable you to reorganize your production uh, in real time. But if you still have a traditional structure of your plant, physically you won't be able to implement what your software has planned. So it's also necessary to change the organization of our production means. And this is uh, wh what we are doing. And if I have to take a specific example, we can do that with, uh, in the furniture uh, industry, uh, kitchen manufacturing, in fact. And uh, the principle of our customer, which is a French customer, is to be able to uh, produce for any customers what he wishes. And this requires a high level of flexibility in his organization. And for the flows in his plant, it was absolutely necessary for him to be able to reorganize uh, physically the flow of all the parts that are necessary to manufacture the furniture. And uh, that's why we have uh, designed for this kind of customer specific robotic sorters in order to reorganize in real time the flow through its production facility. And this is a very good example of what we can do for our customers. I think the question uh, was about uh, Airbus. Um, so, first of all, um, it's always difficult to uh, give some secret about uh, how Airbus is successful, so I will try to stay a little bit general, but if you observe today what's going on on the market and in the aerospace in the commercial industry, particularly with this duopole between uh, Boeing and Airbus, there have been a time where both companies say that they want to sell their uh, manufacturing uh, facilities. Now, this is the opposite, they have reinstalled their manufacturing facility, but they keep um, different layer of supplier, tier one and tier two, and organize very cleverly this uh, supply chain. And uh, if you read the press, you will see that currently there is a new tendency, which is also to reinsert some components produced by those suppliers. And uh, one of the main reasons is that uh, Airbus and Boeing consider that they do big margin, so they want to capture this money. And one of the next reasons, maybe more fundamental, is that thinking to the more electrical aircraft, there are some strategic components that Boeing and Airbus need to master to be able to deliver and produce the next generation of uh, electrical aircraft. 
And for that reason, they have reinsourced some activities of supplier. For Boeing, for example, they just announced a kind of joint venture on uh, auxiliary power units. For Airbus, they were announcing a new innovation nacelle system. And, and once again, it's a way to transform the way they are working, sharing the IP with the suppliers, uh, being able to integrate more services very early in the process of the development of the product. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Djedov, can I ask you how the Russian Ministry of Industry and Trade is also integrating this new value in your uh, roadmap? Well, I suppose the new added value of any new product, it's the uh, aim of our work, it's the final aim. And so we try to build an individual approaches to every case and to every beginning of the transformation process of any organization. We try to build it not only based on the industrial principle, but uh, also on the functional principle when we are talking about the best practices, when we resolve problems which can be presented at any production. And of course, finally, every case is very individual and is based on the kit of technologies that are used on this enterprise and of course on the equipment that was inherited from the previous generations. And it is very important to take into account the partners and the market towards which the product is oriented. And so the ministry has more than 100 different approaches and different support measures. We have, for example, some programs to collaborate the export of the technology production and the cost of certification and localization of products on the foreign markets. Also, we have the, the help, the financial help for studies and for engineering studies also. And of course, we have the, some pilot production. We also generate and create new projects. And in every case, we try to choose some measures which can help to promote this project. And we think individually. And the kit of tools is different every time, of course. So we try to work by project and we consider every partner individually and we consider every task also individually and the industry resolves every problem as its own. And of course we try to implement this approach to every sphere. It's the artificial intellect uh, technology, it's uh, autonomous technique and so on and so on. Thank you very much. We will continue now with uh, the additive technologies, the technology which is bulversing the traditional manufacturing design and production meanings. Benoit, you represent the French uh, joint venture ADUP, which is a joint venture between Michelin and FIV Group, uh, and uh, the leading supplier of additive manufacturing based on metallic. Could you explain uh, your vision on this uh, technology and how do you support your customers in capturing the value? of uh, additive technologies. Uh, good day, uh, good uh, day the ladies and gentlemen. Now we speak in Russian. Uh, what I think about the additive technologies. It's simple. I see additive technologies as several directions. The first direction is the production of the complex parts which can't be produced by another technologies and a part of this direction is the topolo topological optimization which is developing today and it is all connected to the software. And so the EDAP company besides the production of the 3D, 3D printer developed a software, EDAP manager. It's a software, our own software, which includes a very wide spectrum of models 
and they allow to create uh, details and parts and to assess the time of production and the cost of this part before before even having created it. The second direction, uh, what I see here, is the improvement of the characteristics of the parts, not only in terms of its form, but also in terms of its cooling, for example. It's a very difficult and complex task if we take into account the equipment that we have today on the market. But we have an example here in the Michelin company. They created uh, the details with the channel of cooling very close to the surface, closer than it was before, and so they had two results. The first result, of course, is that the parts are operating longer, and also the second result is that the speed of production is faster and higher. So they produce more and the parts are serving longer. So the Michelin company has a great experience here. They produce more than uh, one million parts uh, per year using the additive technologies. And so this experience of Michelin allows us to recommend to our clients all the operations of post-production. Uh, and of course, the additive technologies are not ideal. They have some disadvantages. So one of the dis disadvantages is that uh, the part is not really lean. And another direction here it's the improvement of characteristics of the parts. If we are talking about the beam technology, the company beam was bought by the Adop company. So Adop proposes different uh, technologies. It, for example, selective laser sintering. Uh, it's uh, the selective laser melting and so on. Uh, and the beam company and the technology of this company allows to produce details and parts from different materials at once. And it's changing our approach to this production drastically. So we can produce a part which is hard and solid in the place where it should be solid and hard and so on. And of course, we can have different forms and, and so on. So our approach has been changed. And the third direction here, which I see in the additive technologies, is that Uh, for all industry, but uh, how do you also see the issue raising on health and safety for the operators? Да, я бы попросил вот в принципе крутить видео, которое я подготовил к встрече. I would like to switch on the video that I've prepared. We will show it without the sound. You just will see the equipment that is proposed by the by Adop company. And as I've already told, our company is working on the projects and on the maintenance, but the Michelin chose the uh, smallest fractions of the powder. And of course, here we have some questions about the health and safety of the operators. These questions are connected with the fact that any fractions are created from the different particles and including nanoparticles. And it was proven that they can go, uh, they can go in through the skin or be swallowed. And so there are a lot of risks here. Some materials which we are used are inflammable, for example, the titan in powder, 
uh, other uh, are cancerogenic and Michelin took all the precautions here and the EDAP company developed a solution, Fleece Care. Con the container is fully equipped with the dressing rooms and people are coming there and they are putting on the safety equipment and also people who are working there they should be protected fully and they go through medical medical tests uh, every uh, every period so the growth of uh, industrial additive application is also going in parallel of uh, new materials, new powder, new alloys. And I would like to address this question to the two companies, French companies in additive manufacturing, uh, ADAP and 3D Ceram. Russia is a superpower in raw materials and one of the strategic suppliers of the French industry. What is your vision and uh, what are the cooperation you can imagine with Russia in terms of materials? So we, uh we are working for a long time in Russia with the Beam company and the Dub company. And we had a lot of partners who are producing different materials. And we are working with the Dub uh, with partnership with the VM company, who is the, our key partner in the aircraft building and in the material industry and they will provide us with powders that we can use on our equipment in order to get the best result and we've produced some test items from this powder and we had some very good results there and we have this two-sided result. The change of the results of the production for the VM company. So this work is can be made only in partnership. Thank you. Thank you, Benoit. What about uh, you, Peter, for Fred Salam? So for us, as a ceramic 3D printing company, it's very important as a disruptive technology to adapt to our clients' needs. So for an example, I'll give you an application that we have that is our biggest application in Russia. It's the production of foundry cores. As it's a disruptive technology, it's, as it's a disruptive technology it can be quite important for us to adapt to the client, to use their ceramic powder. What we can provide is that we will develop their ceramic powder with our organic paste to, that it will be able to produce ceramic, technical ceramic cores on our 3D printing machine. We think it's really important that with this type of partnership with certain clients here in Russia and also with Vyam, as Benoit mentioned, that we have this, a type of partnership that we can use to help to provide solutions to clients. Thank you. Let's continue with you. Uh, 3D Ceram is uh, uh, actually a spin-off of uh, one uh, very uh, prestigious uh, technological center in Limoges, uh, in, uh, in uh, ceramic fields. After 17 years of operation, you succeed to be the global leader in ceramic additive manufacturing. And USME actually shows a successful link existing between the innovative startup and the academic ecosystem. Based on your experience, can you introduce the French model of collaboration and innovation? Okay. I, th I think it's, it will be quite ambitious of me to try and give an example of, of a general, a general uh, relationship between, between a, a technique centre and, and a small SME. In our case, for 3D Ceram, we have been connected with the CNRS, which is a centre of ceramics in Europe. It's been hugely beneficial for us to provide us as a small, as we were a small SME, uh, with the technology to use, to use and know how to use what that is used by the government. So we, it is stuff that we should, that would be out of our reach financially. Uh, that has been really, really good for us. We've had academic partnerships. So there has been for specific materials, specific projects together. We have had 
a type of partnership with these people uh, that they will come back to us with the know-how and we will use it to use it in industrialization of this technology of this part which we have already done um, for an example we've done this with some multi-material printing with HTTC with solid oxide fuel cells that, which we are currently developing with the help of the CNRS so for sure partnerships for SMEs is really important and that is hence why we're here in Russia we're looking for partnerships we're looking for collaboration for projects on certain on certain aspects to try and develop more of the ceramic printing. Thank you. Your, your company is very dynamic on the global market and it's also very well known here in Russia, uh, also by industri industrial leaders. I, I think, for instance, of Oteca Group. Uh, can you describe uh, your solution and your perspective uh, opportunities here in Russia? Okay, I think I think uh, as you say, there is quite a, there's quite a, a thirst for knowledge here in Russia for 3D printing. I think maybe in the early 2000s, uh, we 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 think that maybe that Russia did not develop as much as as they should have. So now there is a huge uh, a huge want and and uh, hunger for them to develop, and 3D printing is the solution to that. We see with our with some really big groups here in Russia, ODK, Rosatom. Rosatov, these type of groups are really thirsty for knowledge. They believe that our technology, using an SLA technology, uh, using a turnkey solutions, so what we can do is we can provide uh, ceramic printing with the printer and all the post processes. Our technology is the industrialization of, the, of ceramic printing, which is really important. We believe that we've altered our machine for the Russian market. There are some, issue, there are some uh, aspects that we can work with, uh, with uh, technical centers, but we really believe that the big groups in Russia are the most important about the industrialization of the part and production. We're moving from mass production to mass customization. For some applications, like in the in the spatial, we're providing mirrors which are lighter yet stronger because we're using an optimization of the part. Uh, for such applications in in uh, in the aerospace industry, for turbine blades, we're able to provide ceramic foundry cores that will enhance enhance the shape of the core and the porosity, the strength of the core. These are all really huge disruptive technology solutions that we're providing to the Russian market. So this is just to give you give an example of what we do here. We can, we're providing a complete line, so the line of the printer. We're also developing a 3D mix, which is our paste, our powders that are used in conjunction with partners here in Russia. Who can, for an example, send us their powder. We can develop it that it will be able to be used in our machines. The services we provide are really important for us. It's important for us to accompany our, our clients from A to Z. We can't. We, the, the general the technologies that exist already today. If it can be done by machining, by press, that we, it's not a competition for us. We're here to try and move on, to provide solutions and geometrics and shapes that don't exist already. So that's, that's what we're doing with the services, the training and the post-process. These are some of the aspects that we're working on, some of the applications, the aerospace, the energy, biomedical, and we're even doing some, doing some luxury market. So using stereolithi stereolithography is our technology that we're using. Just to give you guys an example here of, the, of an example of the turbine blades, we're using an access to complex geometrics. We're reducing the cost per core, so the return on investment for large groups, as mentioned by Adrian, will be really, really interesting for them. We're reducing the human core, human resource, as traditional technologies has a lot of lot of steps involved. We're trying to we're reducing that. We're using a different all different types of materials, specific materials. We can adapt to the client's needs. So if the client has a certain ceramic or a certain mix of ceramics that they would like to use, we can use this in our, we will develop this to be used in our machine. This is what we're doing initially. It's the automated printing line and this is what we want to move to. 3D Ceram 4.0, where there will be a fully automated printing line that will have, it, all the processes will be there from the printing to the, to the cleaning, to the processes, post processes to the firing of the, of, the, uh, of the machines. It will be more capable, more profitable, and especially more user friendly. As of this now, whereas we're coming from, from a sort of technical ceramics, can have a type of artisan, artisan uh, an environment, we're trying to push it on to be something of high technology, of breaking disruptive technology, moving forward with the fully automated printing line. Which is at the Let's continue with a company which is at the, at the, at the merge between uh, material physics and digital world with the group uh, ESC. Uh, it's a leading innovator in virtual prototyping softwares 
and uh, Henri, you are the leading the department of big data analytics for industrial performances. Could you describe how big data uh, can prepare the industry to, to face future needs and which kind of application and solution are you bringing to your customer? Yeah, thank you. Uh, indeed, we uh, start the discussion telling that the economy is transforming and now we are talking about an outcome economy more uh, dedicated to uh, the usage instead of the process. We see with uh, machine vendors that machines are more, more and more intelligent with more and more data. So we have now a lot of data, machines, sensors, Fitbit, uh, cell phones, whatever. And uh, uh, the main point is being able to understand this data. So what we call the data analytics. I have a lot of data coming from all my process, my manufacturing process, for example, uh, from the raw material, the machine behavior, the quality of the end line product, and I want to understand this data, analyze this data, and opening new insights with this knowledge. So uh, this is, so in ESI we are uh, now since 45 years uh, working with our customers in their digitalization, uh, first from the virtual prototyping, now going to a more advanced solution. And um, this is, with the data analytics, uh, you're, you're coming back to the real benefits of this data analytics. Once you can collect, combine, correlate, understand uh, all the data coming from your process, your car, or whatever, it open you new, new fields. We talk about taking in account the feedback of the usage of my product, my machine, my car, to refine the design, to enhance the design. This is a first benefit. The second one, oh, there is a lot of benefits, but let's say the second family uh, will be um, related to the process on itself. We are in a global competition. We see that now uh, every country, every company is global. And um, you have also new challenges in terms of energy, in terms of safety, human safety, and so on. So optimizing a process, being able to analyze, understand it first, analyze it, be alert, and predicting some behavior, making your process more reliable. It's also a benefit of data analytics. And it was mentioned uh, uh, um, before me, also analyzing the data of my process, of the part of the product, I'm doing and how I am using it, it's also bringing new services. A lot of my customers uh, um, working on machine rebuilding or a product are telling me, okay, uh, um, their own customer is not asking for a machine, is asking for a service. So uh, they, they, they ask me, okay, we have now to define new business model. I'm not longer a machinery producer builder or a car uh, builder. I'm a, a, a service provider. This is exactly what means the outcome economy. So in ESI, working with, let's say, almost all industries, uh, we understand that more than a technology, uh, it's industrial project. And our job as editors is to understand, put in place, and democratize the use of these advanced technologies, big data, machine learning, deep learning, and so on, uh, and to put it in the end of the industrial experts, that they will use it for their own purpose and objectives. 
So this is uh, what we are doing, uh, what we are trying to enhance industrial uh, uh, operation. Your, your group is developing uh, many digital uh, software and solutions, but one uh, is also famous concept here in Russia, it's a hybrid twins with the merge of physical, mm, physical materials and physics with external environment interaction. Can you describe what is this concept and uh, what do you want to bring, which value do you want to bring to your customer? Yeah. So, virtual twin, digital twin, hybrid twin, a lot of twins, okay? Uh, it could take me one day just to explain it. I will propose, let's say, my own small definition, okay? We have two words. The, the first one uh, coming from simulation. We are coming from simulation ESI. Physics, okay? Casting, stamping, whatever. The physics, the finite, the finite elements. Okay, simulating this process, allowing you uh, to test, to simulate before doing uh, real stuff. So it helps to build, let's say, a virtual twin of your product. We have seen that with data now, we can, repli we can uh, yeah, replicate, we can create a digital twin. The twin, or let's say the representation of your process based on the data which is collected, okay? So we were talking about innovation, you see that innovation is going very fast. Now, what we are trying, what we are doing in ESI, what we are proposing, working on with our customers is combining both worlds, the virtual physics and uh, the IoT. Virtual twin, digital twin, bringing a mix, let's say a combined replica, we are calling hybrid twin, in which you will find information coming from sensors, but also informations coming from the physics, the simulation with advanced model. So a hybrid twin for it, just make, try to make it very concrete. Let's take a, a, a wind turbine, okay? In which you have a gearbox. The gearbox is made by, uh, with steel, okay? Some, let's say, I don't know, casting process, okay? So you have some physics. Uh, in these turbines, and you're also taking data. You have sensors that are measuring the behavior. So with virtual twin, you can define better shape and so on, uh, the gearbox of your turbine, okay? With uh, um, digital twin, with the, uh, the, um, the sensor data, okay? You can monitor it. With an hybrid twin, what hybrid twin uh, open? is enhancing the mentoring, enhancing the alerting, but we are also opening new doors in prediction and most important, prognostic. What if scenarios? I have my wind turbine, okay? It's an offshore one in the middle of the North Sea, so uh, uh, if something happened, I cannot send someone just like that, okay? So I will take the information of the wear of my gearbox, okay? I will ingest this IoT knowledge, information, into my simulation and run what if scenarios. What happened if I have a wine of this speed, if blah, 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 blah. So the decisions that industrial can take on top of that is very valuable for this concrete example of wind, twin, um, wind turbines in northern seas. When they measure some wear in the turbine, what they are doing now is stopping it. So you are losing money because you are losing energy production time. So with our solutions, they are performing what-if scenarios and they get some concrete answers like, okay, based on uh, the level of wear, regarding uh, uh, the, the, 
the weather uh, previ pre provisions. Okay, I can still let my turbine uh, running up to uh, 40, 50 uh, winds, uh, kilometers uh, of wind. So, I, this is this new area that is opening. And again, uh, we are talking about a lot of technologies, a lot of new technologies. In synthesis, my point, we have a lot of marketing, we call it di uh, digital, hybrid, whatever, we are integrating a lot of solutions. But the main point, this is why, uh, this is the, 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 let's say our focus in ESI. First, it's an industrial project before anything. We have to keep this in mind, okay? It's an industrial project and uh, these kind of solutions are based on co-creation. We are here not to work for someone, but to work with someone. This is our DNA in ESI. Thank you, Ari. Let's move with a company which is using extensively uh, simulation and also hybrid twins for their customers. Jean-Pierre, you are the industrial director of Accent. It's an innovative SME uh, located in Toulouse, so no surprise that uh, your first development was on aerospace, but today you have a network all around the world. Can you explain what and how your company supports the French and international leaders, and what is your smart factory concept? Thank you, Adria. Okay, we are in, indeed an engineering company, which means we design and integrate complete manufacturing lines. Uh, as you said, we design, we integrate, which means that we do not manufacture ourselves. I will come back to this point later on. Uh, we have, okay, thank you. I was just going to ask you for this uh, video. What, what you see in the video is uh, a new factory, we, uh, new manufacturing lines, complete manufacturing lines. We, we, we commissioned for Safran for assembling the new lip motors. Uh, this factor, this assembling line is uh, most modern in the world for assembling motors and this is because of this line then we receive the label from the Alliance of the Future and this is because of this line that we are present here today to Inopro. Uh, you saw first our approach of uh, the video, uh, the CAD approach, now this is the line. Uh, I will not enter in details to everything about this line just to say that we have used several technologies. Some of them have been already uh, presented. Oh, go, it goes fast. Uh, some of them were for based on value stream mapping, lean manufacturing, simulation, control regulation, supervision, robotics, cobotics. All these kind of technology have been used. What you see here is something different. It's what we call a Jackson. It's a pattern equipment that we, uh, that we developed. Uh, it's a kind of, uh, let's say, it's a kind of forklift, just normal forklift. The difference is that it, oh, it goes fast. Can you start again, the video? <laughs> Thank you, Adrian. Okay, so we're back to the, to the first line. So, as I said, we integrated uh, different uh, technology bricks, what we call technology bricks, different kind of technologies uh, as being an integrator. Uh, our approach is always to uh, to go either. I mean, on this particular on this particular line, we made the full lines, but our approach includes also to be to take only in consideration one part of the process or just uh, some of the technologies. Uh, this is a complete. This is what we would call the future. That was what we call the future digital plants. Uh, it's still the one. Okay. see the different steps. So the next one is the Jackson, as I started to talk about. So as I said, it's kind of forklift. The difference is a 0 0.02 millimeter accuracy to come in position. So this one was, the first one was developed for the aircraft industry. Uh, so handling the motors, as you can see on the, on the video. Of course, it can be used for any, any other kind of industry wherever is required high accuracy to come in position. 
This is a pattern equipment which can be seen in, uh, in, in France where it's working uh, with no problem. There is also some slides, please. Okay. What, uh, what's our strategy regarding uh, international? We have already a strong experience in, mar in partnership with uh, uh, mainly fr uh, French famous groups all over the world. Uh, we have different kind of experience. Either we, starting from France, we design and we go and commission equipment so, uh, in several countries. Uh, sometimes we manufacture them in France. Sometimes we, ma we, we have the manufacturing done in the, in the final countries. It depends on various things. Sometimes we open uh, a company or offices over there. This was the case in the United States. This was also the case in Mexico, in Romania, in the UK, Germany today. Uh, and uh, we already have a first experience uh, in Russia with these two companies I show on the, on the slide. So we are very open. Uh, we have experience, different kind of experience for, on the international level, which allow us to, uh, to know that it's not always easy. Then we may have uh, there's always problems raising up in a project. And as I say, the, the good project is not the project without problem. It doesn't exist. The good project is a project where when there is a problem, there is a good reaction and a positive reaction between the two partners. Now, maybe more philosophical question, but uh, you are a supplier of uh, automation and uh, new industrial equipment. Uh, your equipment could replace and threaten uh, the position of humans in factory. Uh, what is your vision on the human-machine interaction? Thank you, Adrian. May I ask you for another slide? I'm not surprised by the question. I had a slide ready. <laughs> Immense rem stay, remains in the center of our approach. To, we have the slide here showing you. We, we consider that the, the approach for the, for the future digital enterprise or in between the just modernized enterprise is to avoid value um, work to be done by operator when there is no value. That is the first point. The second approach is to say, okay, we want to raise quality for the product. We want the jobs to be done safely by the operators on the ground. And we want to keep all, we want to raise also the level of the employees. We were talking before, I heard before about uh, uh, the requirement, of course, to have more and more uh, educated engineers. This is obviously uh, necessary, but it's also necessary, it's also, yeah, uh, necessary, required. Uh, also to keep employees in working in the plants because they have some know-how. So we believe that it's very important to, uh, to foresee in the projects to have training, important training with the people. Uh, and so we can train them to use uh, all these new technologies, all the bricks we are going to implement. That's what we call the technological bricks we are going to implement in your new manufacturing lines. Started to, to talk about them before, the value stream mapping, which lead to the lean which is a tool for the lean manufacturing, the simulation, control regulation, and supervision. ESI talked about it just before. Uh, we use, of course, the augmented reality and virtual reality for training people, or just during the different phases of the project to exchange with the engineers uh, of the, uh, for the future project, to exchange with them so we can see what is going to be the plan that we're going to deliver and to together uh, value the different uh, phases. Of course, robotic will be part of the equipment, and cobotic. Cobotic is a new, uh, is a new, is a new approach of robotic, where you can have a man working together with a robot. So the man, the man still brings his high, his added value because of his know, and uh, the robot brings just, uh, I mean, relieve the operator from the hard job. So this is our, this is our approach. So to answer just a two words. Uh, to, to your question, Adrien, uh, we believe that, of course, there will be not 100% of the people will be will be safe, but we we believe that we can uh, help a lot, many a lot of people. Talking about the ground people, the people working on the floor, we can educate them and raise them by training to to move towards this uh, digital enterprise. Thank you, Jean-Pierre. To continue on this uh, question of equilibrium between humans and new technology. 
uh, Henri, uh, do you think that data over the years will become more important than human talent in the industry? No. Uh, concretely, no. Uh, data, as I was mentioning, the uh, added value of data is related to the human expertise. Okay? Your machine could produce as many data as you want, okay? If you don't bring your industrial expertise in the correlation, in the understanding, in building something, it's useless. And uh, uh, even if you buy, let's say, a black box predictive model, okay? Running it, applying it concretely in real, you will need to maintain, to update and so on. And now, uh, just to conclude, your uh, uh, new, let's say, uh, marketing terms related to big data, which is the human in the loop and the human machine learning, the human computing. And it, it's exactly uh, uh, the point, bringing, understanding this mathematics and trying to make it simple to use, to understand, and to leverage by the experts. So no, data will not replace human. Human will use the data to be more powerful. I know that the place of human is also an important point of both the French and the Russian uh, program on industry of the future. Uh, Yannick, as uh, the director of FIV, but also as a, uh, an important uh, stakeholder of the Alliance Industry of the Future, what is your vision on this French <coughs> program? Uh, as you said, uh, human is at the center of the action of the Alliance for Industry du Futur. And I could take two examples to illustrate that. Uh, one is a big part of the work that is done in the Alliance, which is to train uh, small and medium enterprises to the use of uh, these new technologies. Because it's a transformation process, and for a company to be transformed, it's needed that human understand how to use these new technologies, which requires much training. And uh, the other one is uh, the use of data that people can do. Uh, they are users of uh, data. So if uh, people, um, these are tools. So if you need a tool, it's because you are able to use it. So basically, you still need the user when, you, when it comes to using data. Thank you, dear colleagues. It's now time to conclude this roundtable. Uh, Mr. Dojdev, what is your takeaway message uh, for the audience and to the French companies? I would like to thank you very much. Thanks a lot to all participants of the discussion and to the Alliance Industry of the Future. All the technologies we've been discussing are the technologies of the future and the virtual twins allow us to cut down the number of tests from hundreds to sometimes only one. And the technologies of industrial internet allow us to cut down on investments and increase the efficiency of our equipment by 10%, for example. And we can list these new benefits but the major point is this is the future and this is unavoidable and we should work together, work out together joint solutions, create joint platforms, develop joint projects. And in this respect, Russian-French cooperation is a very good example of the environment, of the milieu where such projects can develop very successfully and we will be working very hard to do that. Thank you message of openness and, and your call for stronger cooperation with the French companies. We'll make sure that we will continue to, to have this French-Russian dialogue. And as uh, Jean-François said, uh, in uh, October, we are planning to have a very big event here in, um, in Moscow uh, on uh, gathering the French uh, and the Russian political and industrial leaders and working groups between experts to continue the assessment of uh, opportunities and technology of cooperation. Um, and as you, as, you, as you can see, we also organize some different missions or in uh, Moscow or in France where uh, the delegation and also Russian delegation could also meet and see uh, these uh, French companies.
Thank you very much for your attention. Možno pa zase. Thank you for your question. Uh, well, uh, the French company ESC has actually a very strong already cooperation here in Ural, and they have an uh, office uh, based in Yekaterinburg. And uh, I think uh, Yannick and uh, Jean-François, if you could uh, mention your cooperation, yes? So I will answer your question. We work in the Salda city, Benoit can give you more details what FIV is doing over there. I think it is a very interesting project. Yes, FIV works over here in different directions, as you may have understood from our discussions. One of the direction of our work is machine building and uh, titanium uh, producing and titanium cutting lasers. And it is no secret that in Salda there is uh, titanium processing. And we sold almost all the lasers which process different spare parts for Boeing, Airbus, Embraer, and other aerospace and uh, aircraft producing companies. And I can give you other examples. But most important is machine building for air industry. We used to work with the Eurodal Federal University as well in additive technologies. There was a joint project with Micromed, which was not quite successful, but we shared our experience in additive technologies with different enterprises, not only in Yekaterinburg, but in Perm. In Perm, we produced several samples which are being tested right now and most likely our equipment of beam company will be shipped to perm and we have other projects as well we can continue this list the standards of the future. The industry of the future requires new standards because we have new risks, new tasks. Mention uh, what have been signed also in St. Petersburg. I think it's also going in this direction. and. Uh, also on DASO system, uh, your work on standardization. Thank you. Thank you very much for the question. As we understand the development of new standards today is on the level of uh, European Union, we don't want to have separate standards in every country of uh, the EU, but we try to develop the standards on the level of the European Union. That's what we can say today. But it is necessary, of course. It's extremely important, and, uh, and you are right, uh, because first of all, we need to live in an open world. And uh, even uh, if we uh, consider, for example, that we have a suite which is able to cover 90%, customers are always free to select something else, or customers are free also to do their own development and to integrate. So 
we need to offer, first of all, a platform which is open and a platform which is fitting with standards. Uh, there are a couple of standards that already exist in the domain of numerization of data. For example, a text standard like STEP. In terms of uh, modelization of system, you have standards that exist that's called FMI standard. I think the, the key topic uh, is, first of all, to make sure that the level of the standard is enough respected, and not only in Europe, but all over the world, because once again, the world is totally interconnected. So even if in Russia you collaborate not with all countries, at least we must provide standards which are uh, supporting a worldwide uh, connection. But more important also, I believe that the standards should be developed in such a way that on one hand, it's not restricted the innovation of the supplier and the provider who provide tools. So in another way, we want to keep some freedom to put some innovative capabilities, even if the standards are a little bit late or behind uh, the capability we provide. And in other words, it's also important that all people, all companies are respecting the standards. You know, it's like on the road. Uh, if some people are arriving on the right and others are driving on the left, it's becoming very quickly a mess. So there is a need for everybody to respect standards, whatever are their origin, French, American, or Japanese, or Chinese. And this must be handled at a very high level. And I personally support the fact that if some company are not respecting the standards, it must be known, and they must get some penalties. If we consider the standards for data sharing, for instance, or you have uh, standards that are uh, European, for instance, OPC UA or MT Connect in the US and so on. But as you said, it's necessary to maintain innovation. And what is very important in the area of data, it's uh, open source development too. And it's another way for people to share what they develop as new technology, but also they want to share. And in the end, without making big decisions at uh, international level, there is a common culture that is being shared through this sharing, through open innovation. So we strongly believe on the development based on, on this kind of uh, uh, sharing. Okay. And one more information on the question of standards. With uh, the Alliance France, uh, the Alliance Industrial of the Future, we already uh, start discussion with the RSPP. Uh, and uh, next year, we should have uh, one uh, meeting in Paris between the French and the Russian experts to also have a look on uh, how uh, both countries and both industries will uh, clarify the standards. Did any other question from the audience? So thank you very much again for your attention, and, and we hope to see you uh, very soon in October in Moscow. Thank you. <laughs>